So this uh, issue got on my radar around 2013. I have a good friend who works at a drinking water wastewater utility and they're getting consumer questions about whether there was plastics in their drinking water. And I thought that's, that's crazy. What are the chances that's getting through all the treatment that we have? So I thought, let's go to the source. Let's go to surface water, which serves as the source of most drinking water and see if we can find the plastics. And then from there, we wanted to ask questions about whether those microplastics were serving as carriers for harmful microbes. Uh, there had been some reports that out in the middle of the ocean they were finding microbes that looked like wastewater microbes that shouldn't have been there, so maybe this could be serving as a unique way of transporting microbes into new environments. So naively, we started by thinking that most of the problem was just the personal care products you were hearing about in the news. So we started by purchasing a bunch of face, facial scrubs and trying to see what was in them. And just from the beginning, we saw this was not what I was expecting because most of the particles you see up here are not the spherical microbeads that they were reporting finding in some of the surface waters. You can see a lot of them uh, look like fragments, like the, the ones towards the left. And when we divide these up into size classes, you'll also notice that most of the ones we were observing in the facial products um, were about 100 to 500 microns. Um, and a lot of that's smaller than the mesh size of a lot of nets that folks were using to sample. Um, so when we decided to design our studies to look for what microbes were growing on these surfaces in the lab, we decided to focus on those size classes. And then we started doing surveys of the Raritan River, which is beautiful. It flows through the center of New Jersey out into Raritan Bay, where you get wonderful views of the New York skyline. And here are some examples of the particles that we were seeing in the water that when we do FTIR chemical analysis were indeed plastics. So you can see that um, there's a range of morphology shapes here. Um, very few were that we ever observed were those perfectly spherical microbeads. Um, and a lot of these are not too hard to pick out with visual identification, but you do have an issue of potential false positives when you're just doing visual ID. So here's your Saturday morning test. Which of these is not a microplastic? Can you tell? Um, the one on the lower right hand corner here is actually a fragment of wool fiber that we observed there. Um, if we go out to Raritan Bay and we trawl nets, the concentration of plastics is much higher than when we were in the freshwater in the river. Um, everything that's bright blue and bright yellow there, um, we scanned and those are polyethylenes. But you'll also see there's a lot of other debris. So when it came for us to design some studies looking at microbe-microplastic interactions, we thought, well, it's going to be difficult to do these on samples that we collect from the water. One, in order to confirm that they're plastics, we normally oxidize as one of the first steps, and that would be removing biofilm. Um, the other is you have this potential for false positives, and it would be creating a lot of extra work, plus the fact that there's a ton of other floating debris as well, a lot of leaf litter and such. So when it came time for us to study these in the lab, I had a student who wanted to look at the microbes on these. Uh, we decided to uh, create microcosms in the lab um, with plastics we extracted from personal care products, some that we purchased from lab supply companies, and we'll always also use some control substances. So in this case, we used uh, glass microbeads um, so that they're the, the same size but not plastic. Um, and more recently, we've been using wood chips as well. I think it's important to have some material controls in here. Um, and for some of the data I'll show you today, it's exactly from these particles. So some uh, polyethylene that we extracted from personal care products, some polystyrene spheres, and glass microbeads. And we incubate these in different water sources. So we use wastewater. One of our reasons there is that there's a lot of combined sewers in the region that I live in. If you don't know what a combined sewer is, it takes rainwater and what you flush down the toilet, it goes to the same pipe. Um, when it's not raining, it works fine. It goes to the wastewater treatment plant. When it is raining, they'll overflow untreated. So we figure this is sort of the worst case scenario you can simulate, putting some plastics in untreated wastewater and seeing what that looks like. We also incubated them in Raritan River water as well, because um, so we were observing a lot of plastics that were not necessarily coming from the wastewater treatment plants in the surface water. Um, and then we'll remove the, separate the particles from the filtrate so we can compare those communities 
So some of the tools that we've been using to study these microbes are normal cultivation techniques. Um, drinking water, wastewater engineers are always interested in the fecal microbes. Um, so if we try to incubate these microparticles in wastewater, river water, um, you can see that fecal microbes are growing on the microplastic surface. But as you might imagine, they're also growing on other surfaces for materials. So wood chips, if we put them in there, you'd have comparable levels of fecal bacteria. Um, we've also done some quantitative PCR looking for some more specific markers of potentially harmful microbes. So you can see that, yes, you get bacteria that carry antibiotic resistance genes growing on the microplastics, but it's not necessarily in higher concentration than other microparticles, um, as well as human fecal indicator organisms. And if you compare it to the filtrate, um, you would get different microbial communities. So we've also done some sequencing results shown in the lower right here. Um, as you'd expect, wastewater looks different from rare and river water, despite whatever your opinion is of New Jersey's water quality. Um, the filtrate looks different from the biofilm, which you might expect anyway. There's different microbes that like to grow attached as opposed to planktonic. Um, but when we look at the microbial community structures, the main thing that's separated um, the, the biofilm communities out what seemed to be the surface morphology of the particle rather than the material it was made of. So if we had glass spheres or polystyrene spheres, the communities would cluster together in some cases, as opposed to our polyethylene, which had rougher surfaces. Um, so from that bench scale study, we could conclude that, as you'd expect, the water quality influenced the biofilm community that we saw um, the microparticle type mattered, but in our opinion, it seemed to be perhaps more due to the morphology rather than the material that it was made out of. Um, and for the particle sizes that we looked at from 100 to 500 microns, it didn't significantly affect the community. Now, if you went to smaller particles, perhaps down to the nano size, we were getting closer to the size of a microbe, um, perhaps that conclusion would be different. So if you're interested in this work, uh, the, the biofilm wastewater rare and river study is out. And we've also given a lot of thought to the, the chemistry and the source tracking for microplastic particles. So you can read our work on that as well. Um, the work is fun and interesting. Picking out the particles and scanning them is is always fun to see what they turn out to be, but it is tedious work, so I should thank all the students that did all of the hard work for doing this. In particular, uh, Kathleen Parrish did uh, most of the work that you saw today. Thank you for joining me this morning. Mm -hmm.